everybody. Let's learn some Torah. It's Parshat Shemot, and we can talk about Shemot in lots of ways. One of them is the beginning of our story as a nation. We can also talk about it as the beginning of Moses' story. But what's really important to remember is that Shemot is so miraculous because of the degradation, because of the depths to which we had fallen and to which we had been pushed. Whereas the Israelites, the Jews, had been parts of constructing society, doing our best as members of a greater community, to raise everyone up, to save lives, to do the kind of work that we do as Jews in the world, or we are called to do anyway, to make sure that justice is done, to make sure that the institutions that hold people in safe places are strong, and to be part of feeding people and clothing people and redeeming people fighting for peace. Well, in the ancient world and in the modern world, just because you have good intentions and try to show up as good citizens and neighbors doesn't mean that things go well. This has been articulated by early Zionist thinkers in the Jewish world, like Herzl and Achad Ha'am, even other voices that aren't typically included in Zionist dialogue, um, like Jabotinsky, or religious Zionists like Rav Cook, their original words, which I've been spending a lot of time recently with, are very helpful because they remind us of the necessity of a safe home. For the Jewish people, that means a Jewish homeland too, but it also means fighting anti-Semitism wherever Jews live. Because unfortunately, since time immemorial, it has been a problem. So much so that when we look at this week's Parsha and we see the dehumanization process that Pharaoh and the Egyptians um, led against the Jews. And I keep on saying Jews, though obviously in the Torah there's no such thing as a Jew, yet it's Israelite. We were then named for Yehuda, our ancestor Judah. That's where Judaism comes from. But the kindred parts of our family's story means that sometimes I use the word Jew in the Torah. Well, when Moses came with a language of redemption that he was given by God to deliver to us, saying to Pharaoh, let my people go, and telling the people, us, that it was time. It was time. Redemption time. Liberation time. Dignity time. Freedom time. We had been so crushed pressurized, condensed. The word Mitzrayim, Egypt, also is understood midrashically as Meitzarim, narrow waters, constriction. That when Moses came with the language of redemption and Pharaoh said no and made us work even harder, this is what happens in chapter 6, verse 9. Vayadaber Moshe Kain el b'nei Israel. Moses spoke to the children of Israel, Velo Shamu el Moshe, and they could not hear Mikotzaruach Umeavodakasha because of crushed spirits and cruel bondage, hard labor. Sometimes it gets so hard to envision that the world could be any better, that my lungs could include the air of freedom, that we can't even hear the message of the Prophet. Yesterday we marked the 50th yurt site of one prophet, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who became toward the end of his life dear friends with another prophet, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is the final book that he wrote, Where Do We Go From Here? And in it, he sequestered himself toward the end of his life just before he was assassinated and wrote these words. And in the essay, the title essay, Where Do We Go From Here? I want to read to you just two small sections because the idea that the Israelites couldn't imagine their own freedom is unfortunately echoed through history. It should bring together all oppressed people to understand that we have a shared humanity that is sometimes denied. As Jews, we have learned this lesson, we continue to learn this lesson, and we will fight for our dignity. And we, as Jews, include so many different kinds of people, ethnic origins, racial identities, so many Jews of color, so many Jews 
from Middle Eastern states. There are so many ways that Jews show up in the world that when someone says you don't look Jewish or someone claims a Jewish ethnic origin as a racial identity, we are more complicated than that. And our inner diversity teaches us what it is to be a human being too. Standing in solidarity with others is ultimately standing tall as a self. So I want to read something important. Well, the whole thing is important. Two small parts of what Dr. King wrote here. He wrote, the great majority of Americans are suspended between opposing attitudes. They are uneasy with injustice, but unwilling yet to pay a significant price to eradicate it. I want to say that again. The great majority of Americans are suspended between opposing attitudes. Mm -hmm. They are uneasy with injustice, but unwilling yet to pay a significant price to eradicate it. A clarion challenge to all of us. And he writes in the 60s, saying that so many look at the progress that the civil rights movement made in the 60s. And they say, but there is still racism. We accomplished nothing. Dr. King says, upon reflection of is way too short a life. But the significant advances that were made that he was a participant in, not an outlier of, and we are all called to be participants in, but he said the goal was not to eradicate racism in the North, but the Southern states, the Southern states saw enormous change. I want to read to you just a little bit of what he wrote here, and given that Martin Luther King Jr. Day is on Monday, and today is Thursday. Today and tomorrow and Monday, I'll be focusing in our, uh, in our learning together, channeling some of Dr. King's language as comments on the Parsha. So listen to what he says. A decade ago, not a single Negro entered the legislative chambers of the South except as a porter or chauffeur. Today, 11 Negroes are members of the Georgia House. If you could only have seen his successor at the Ebenezer Memorial Baptist Church, Reverend Raphael Warnock, as a senator from Georgia. If you could only have seen it, maybe he does. Ten years ago, Negroes seemed almost invisible to the larger society, and the facts of their harsh lives were unknown to the majority of the nation. Today, civil rights is a dominating issue in every state. Crowding the pages of the press and the daily conversations of white Americans. How right he was, how right he is, how incomplete the work is, but how miraculous the changes that we continue to see and push for in American society. In this decade of change, the Negro stood up and confronted his oppressor. He faced the bullies and the guns, the dogs and the tear gas. He put himself squarely before the vicious mobs and moved with strength and dignity toward them and decisively defeated them. Amen, amen, amen. For more than a century of slavery and another century of segregation, Negroes did not find mass unity, nor could they mass mount mass actions. The American brand of servitude tore them apart and held them in paralyzed solitude, but in the last decade Negroes united and marched, and out of the new unity and action vast monuments of dignity were shaped, courage was forged, and hope took concrete form. For hundreds of years Negroes had, to, had fought to stay alive by developing an endurance of hardship and heartbreak. In this de decade, the Negro stepped into a new role he no longer would endure. He would resist and win. He still had the age-old capacity to live in hunger and want, but now he banished these as his lifelong companions. He could tolerate humiliation and scorn, but now he armed himself with dignity and resistance, and his adversary tasted the gall of defeat. For the first time in history, the Negro did not have to use subterfuge as a defense or solicit pity. His endurance was not employed for compromise with evil, but to supply the strength to crush it. To crush it. The majestic words of our fallen prophet, Dr. King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. 
hear his words and then hear again the verse from this week's Parsha. When Moshe, Moses, our prophet, brought this language, saying that God promises, I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I, God. But when Moshe told this to the Israelites, they would not listen to Moses. They could not hear him. With crushed spirits from cruel, cruel bondage. How can we not hear these words, the words of prophets intermingling after hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt, after centuries of degradation in America? These stories are one, friends. This liberation is a united effort that we are called to make, to celebrate, to amplify, to cry from, to be inspired by. The work is not done. We reread the words of our Torah, we reread the words of our prophets, and we celebrate the leaders among us who fight for justice. We amplify it as a core Jewish concern. We stoke within ourselves the discontent with the way the world is. And we set our feet upon this earth, ready to march arm in arm with our sisters and brothers. The work of civil rights is certainly not done. Calling out institutional racism is a mandate. And as Dr. King pointed out in one of his final writings, where do we go from here? We dare not deny the progress that we have made because that should be fuel for the work ahead. Just because we haven't gotten to the mountain doesn't mean we can't see it. We learn that from the giants, the giants we are blessed to have as long as we are blessed to have them. Moshe didn't make it to the promised land. Dr. King didn't make it to the promised land. We lost both but we have not lost their hearts, and we dare not forget their message. Friend, let's go into today with determination, with appreciation, with gratitude, and with a commitment to move this world one inch closer to the way it ought to be. We dare do no less for the sakes of our children.